631, and I'd like to call the June 1st, 2021 special board meeting for the first budget walk workshop of the Niles Main District Library Board to order. Cindy, could you please take the roll? Chessie Derblin? Here. Chessie Hanshaw? Here. Chessie Schoenfeld? Here. Chessie Nicola? Here.
rejected virtual programs to be replaced with those identified to have generated high community involvement by other public libraries. The library board may want to request Ms. Signer or Ms. Lemke to provide a list of the number of participants at every virtual program held by the Niles Main Library within the last year. This list can then be used to determine trends of interest by the Niles Main community. The library's virtual programs with high resident participation would be supplemented by virtual programs from other public libraries to generate a set of, of future programs. This would ensure greater participation in future virtual programs by the Niles Main District Library. Thank you very much. And I just wanted to add that I uh, got the actual attendance figures from the library staff. Uh, she must have pulled data from the Facebook site, but that's not where we keep our attendance figures. The quarantine quartet, which she has listed, but I'm assuming this is Agnes, so I, I apologize if that's not right. It says it has zero that attended. It was actually 180. Um, the cabaret singer program, it's listed as zero, it was 177. A program that we have coming up tonight has 450 attendees signed up already. So, and then for, Cecilia does work part time at the Skokie Public Library. I don't know why that is of interest to a resident. Those are our two public comments for tonight. Okay, thank you, Susan. Uh, next on our agenda, item number five is new business. Um, it is for discussion and gathering of pertinent information regarding each department's 2021-22 budget. Do I have a motion? I don't need a motion even discussion. though it's discussion. discussion. Okay. Because we don't need it even though it's an agenda item because it's not a vote. Right. Okay. I wasn't sure. Thank you. Okay. So, um, moving along, our first department is administration um, and if I'm correct our presenter is Dr. Susan Lucky, right? Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you for passing those out. Is this, this thing that we just got 
We discussed this now, and we're supposed to respond to something. I don't know what you're talking about. No, this is from Greg. Yeah, what this is this? Susan. What you're talking about is the stuff that I assume this Joe says delivered to our from house. Joe McCool and Caroline. And who is Joe to decide for the whole board? Okay, there's no decision made. These are recommendations, and you're going to hear Well, who is he to make the recommendation? Because he's the treasurer going through the budget. So and Susan needs to realize okay, so we can, she can write something up next week and bring it in. You can do whatever you want. Oh, but we haven't done anything in six years. But please, if there's something oh, you'd like to do, oh, you're so hot air, Carolyn. But Susan, seriously, rather than cause this dissension and all this negativity, if you would just read the entire statements when you make oh, these yeah, comments. Okay. Just read the statement. Read it now. Keep like 2020, 2021, 2022 budget is based on 54 hours of operation weekly. Our schedule is 70 hours per week. The director will adjust daily operating hours to reflect the 54 hours of highest patron usage per week. That is the full statement that I have here. And I'm only bringing this up because I think it's very important for everyone to understand that that is one person's idea. He is the treasurer, so he has done a little bit more analysis than many people, and I'm sure he has had things to say about it himself. But I was really horrified by the amount of cutting, and I don't think that you even started on the amount of cutting of staff that you intend. Okay, and if, 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 if you would like him to respond now to the 54 instead of 70 hours, so we can all get some clarification, please, I think it would be best. You've been operating at 54 hours a week for the last six months, right? Or even less, right? And, and there's we're getting ready to go into phase five in two weeks. Yeah. And we were planning on, but the circulation is, is down to nothing. I mean, it's mm -hmm. less than half of what it was in a good year, and, and it doesn't make sense to, to, to be open. All basically, we're cutting Sunday, that's all we're cutting. The rest of those hours are, are um, that's not that's the not other day we're open. Sunday is what, four hours? Sunday is four hours, so 70 minus four. But it's basically six hours because it's time and a half. It is not time and a half. We cut that last year. Greg and I cut uh -huh. that last year. I, I think we can operate on 54 hours. We don't need to be open on Sunday. Okay. That's, that's your lowest attendance day, summer and winter, maybe a little bit in the fall, maybe in the spring, but it's it's not worth opening for that. Right. I'll tell the people who would come on Sunday. Well, you know what? If they want to call Sundays, that's one thing. Cutting the hours to 54 is something totally different. And, 54 is uh, I think it's really kind of inconsiderate to make this decision and tell us, because this is what the board is doing. Excuse me. This isn't the board's decision. This is your decision, Joe. A man who hasn't totally been on the board for two weeks is making the decisions for the board. So that was the other thing that I wanted to bring up is that I, I do think, um, I just want to remind the board that I did at the orientation pass everybody out a copy of Standards for Illinois Libraries, which we are required to follow if we want to get our per capita grant money this year. It was $76,000 last year. I understand that it's supposed to be more than that this year. This is not just like recommendations. This is our standards. This is what we're supposed to do, and that number of hours does not fit with our with the chart in here of our size of community. And then the other thing that you're supposed to be basing your budget choices on is a current strategic plan. And so we are at the end of the five years of the last strategic plan. You need to do the work of talking to the community and finding out what they need before you decide what changes to make. So having said all that, and thank you for allowing me to get that off my chest. Uh, I'm going to go through the pack, the packet that we have for you. Uh, so you asked for a list of our staffing. These are the five um, administration employees. The background, it, it, I spell out what each person does in the written material that you had in your budget packet. Uh, professional development. Um, what I did is I took all of the supervisors requests for attending conferences. There were a lot of requests, for example, to attend the Public Library Association conference. And so I decided that we would send a maximum of five people from the library to that, not excluding trustees. Trustees are treated separately. So if you guys decide you want to go to that conference, that's a little different. Excuse me, what page are you on? I still want to label four professional development. Oh, there would be, I thought you were, never mind. I got it. All right, thank you. Sure. 
And what's this note at the bottom? Uh, All well, professional development eliminated, according to Joe McCool and Carolyn Freeway. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Yes, yeah, so I had already cut back on the request for um, professional development, but uh, my understanding is that we were told that we aren't going to have any professional development or any form of staff training this year at all. Can I ask a question? Personal development, isn't that something according to the standard of the library? It is. Yeah, we have to get yes, yeah. we're supposed to be training. So our staff this is going to students. possibly eliminate our whole grant because of simple things like this in their one of the things. It's one of the things. And Thank then you. they also eliminated going to the chamber events to mix with the community and talk with people, the leadership lunch and the night of Rose. Uh, but most importantly, it eliminates the staff day, where we have one day where we close to the public and we bring in presenters, we do training, like the last time it was um, state-required training on sexual uh, harassment prevention, um, so it has eliminated that item too. But the, this is what I am standing by, this is what, as far as I'm concerned, is still the budget, are these items, which and I did reduce the number of attendees. So for the admin, I had just, uh, I was planning to go to that, and I was also planning to go to ALA. So I am accounted for under those two things. Uh, the IUG conference is for the um, database, the library of you know, CCS and our Polaris database. They do the conference where they share information and get the latest updates. For $75, I cannot imagine not having Cindy go to that. Next page, memberships and subscriptions. Uh, I understand that uh, Joe wants to not have the library be a member of the Chamber of Commerce next oh, year. Oh, community involvement, there you go. Yep, and also not to be a part of this Polaris user group that I just mentioned. Uh, they did, it looks like, keep the money in for homelessness training, and I'm very grateful for that, and also for HR Source, which is a great resource, very economical and also for our institutional memberships to ALA and ILA. But all personal memberships, they uh, have decided that everybody should have to pay for themselves. So that basically means that last week you uh, cut library staff salaries by increasing the amount that they have to pay for their health insurance, and now you are forcing them to pay their professional subscriptions. I mean, it's not that's a fair thing to do, Many, not every library does it. It is a perk, but you're cutting two things simultaneously. Moving on to the next page, it is the, just the sheets that spell out the expenditures that fall under administration services. Many of the things that are for the whole library fall under administration services. So on page one, you've got the payroll, which you've already seen. Uh, we didn't put in any money for periodicals. The charges for a CCS for a database, that all falls under, uh, used by everybody in the library and everybody outside of the library, but it falls under administration. Uh, the charge is 84,310 is what they are predicting for next year, but that fee is not actually going to be set until July for the CCS budget meeting. Uh, and we also will be getting a portion back of that from a grant that they get through Rails, which we got just recently. Uh, that item for software and licenses is, I believe, for Gale Analytics for Cindy's database use, uh, not database use, your data use no committee, where she has a committee that is the data task force that is pulling information about people in the district. Finding out, for example, who in the district has internet access, where are they located, where are their holes where people don't have it, and things like that, there are things the census. And so Gale Analytics helps us analyze all of that. Uh, there are no printing, library supplies, programming adults. Moving on to the next page. Uh, as you know, we have um, our past years of local records, things like the board minutes, documents that we have to keep for many years. Those have moved off-site to Iron Mountain, where they're kept uh, very safe, and they can retrieve things for us when we need it. And then periodically, we um, work with the state to decide what things can be destroyed. Uh, for capital grant expenditures, uh, I don't remember everything that falls into this, but when I filled out the per capita grant application, I spelled out general categories that we would be spending that money on. I know that part of it is to finish the website development. And then the volunteer line goes into this section. That is just to do um, like a 
give them like t-shirts, there were polo shirts to wear, and a little lunch to thank them, things like that. Let's see. Uh, the, in the next section under general and administration, uh, we have legal fees. We have boosted that up considerably this year because, um, as you know, since we hired a lawyer last week, uh, we anticipate having some higher legal fees in the coming year. Uh, I also, we also put in $15,000 for consultants. That is primarily for a consultant to work with the board on creating a new strategic plan. We can talk more about the need to get that going. Um, most of the other things are very mundane. There is a line at the bottom of the page here for trustee expense. And that, we will put whatever you want in that line. Uh, it would cover something like uh, I think Sasha is going to talk about the 4th of July parade. It would cover your t-shirt if you were going to march in the parade. It, it would be for you to go to PLA if you wanted to attend a conference, uh, if, if you wanted to do any local, like the uh, trustee boot camp that Olivia and Becky went to. It covers those kinds of expenses. So we will need to hear from the board what you want in that line. That is up to you. And. Uh, that's basically it. The parking lease is found on the third and final page. And I will say that when I arrived today at work, the uh, whole area that is set aside for staff parking was full. So that is where we may end up with unhappy neighbors who don't like our staff parking on the street. That is how we ended up with the parking lease today. Can I answer any questions for you? Um, let's see, um, we should start with Trustee Makula, let's go down the line. Do you have any questions? Uh, I, I think, uh, let's, let's start here, the, uh, the conferences. Why do we need to travel and have hotel expenses for eight people? What is, what is the outcome? What is the, I, how, how does that, improve service to patrons? Oh, that's, that's actually a great question. You get lots of ideas for improving service to patrons at these conferences. That's part of what you go for. If you hear what other libraries have been doing, there are presenters uh, from all different sizes of public libraries. It's completely focused on public libraries, and you come back with more ideas even than you can use. So it actually uh, does always translate to great patrons. If it's a major idea, don't you think it would be online and people would be writing about it I think so no and, and I mean it hasn't and been historically this last year uh, there definitely were many more things online the ALA conference is, is virtual again uh, and this will be the first one in person and yeah it, you know if we miss it one time it's not a tragedy you know we can cope with that it's uh, you know but that's far from the worst thing I'm much more concerned about staff being cut and not getting to go to conferences but I think it's very very good value to send people in particular to the PLA conference and I think it's a great thing for trustees to do too because you guys get great ideas from me so we yeah. actually have one in our area okay. uh, uh, excuse, me, me. excuse me I'm, I'm sorry I'm sorry God forbid I interrupted Carolyn so thank you the total cost on that first line item is eight thousand dollars not sixteen hundred no, the, the five attendees is for the entire library. This is just the cost for me to attend, uh, the person from admin to attend. I would be one of the five slots. So uh, that is a little confusing. Plus, plus the other uh, 4,800, you're talking 12,000. It, it, it would be, yeah, it would be for five people to go, it would be whatever that ends up to. And this time UG conference, is that local or online, or what is that? Online. Mm -hmm. Online. It's online. And the coding uh, workshops at twenty dollars each. One one for the administration. Yep. Uh, staff day. Now that's the last time they had staff day was Martin Luther King Day. People tried to get in the library. The library was closed. Um, uh, actually, yeah, Martin Luther King Day is always on a Monday, and staff day is always on a Friday. Leadership lunch. Is that what the uh, uh, mayor chamber of commerce? Correct. That's where the mayor gives a sort of state of the village speech. Why do they charge us? They should do it free. They should let us in free. They shouldn't charge us for any of that. If they want us, 
they should be free. Let them know. I mean, it's our opportunity to get to meet with other people in the village. If, if, they want, if these people price. have value, you they'll do it for free. You don't need to kind of contribute to them. And same with this uh, Knight of Roses. I, I feel that, you know, they, they should allow the, the, the village and the, and the library and the park district to come in free. Their people want to speak with us, too. I would, I would talk to them. I would cut that out. And, and the dues to the Chamber of Commerce also. That's not bringing us any benefit. That is just not it's, it's bringing us a lot of benefit. Image, that's all. Um, is on the executive board of the chamber, and I'm sure she'll be happy to talk more about that. Right. I, th I think they should kick in for a library, whatever Mahomet is. Uh, we shouldn't have to pay. They should, they should, we should be their guest, in my opinion. I, I support the homeless training, uh, the HR resource here. Right. Okay, ALA. CPA Society. Do we have a CPA in the house here? Are, are you a CPA or just an accountant? No, CPA. Oh. But that's that's a. I have a brother, two brothers that are CPAs, and they, and they pay for their own. Uh, uh, every year they go to conferences and to, to keep up their. They pay it out of their pocket, so I think that should be the case. and dues, what, what does that amount to? Uh, the total down here is 5290 Is that magazines or? No, subscriptions and dues is the memberships to the chamber to the American Library Association. So that's a summary of the uh, previous thing that right. they discussed? Yes. the membership in the uh, Chamber of Commerce and the expenses associated with that and, and the travel expenses. And we can go without that. We didn't do it last year because of COVID. I don't think we need to do it this year. I mean, if this was two hundred two hundred eighty-five dollars was local in Chicago here, I don't know where you're going. Las Vegas, Hawaii, what is it? Yeah. Uh, it's it's uh, local. Uh, Hawaii. Well, the travel expense thirteen hundred fifteen dollars. No, that, that's Washington, D.C. Pardon? That's Washington. The PLA is in Portland, Oregon, and ALA is in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. I do have staff that are, um, that have leadership roles in some of these organizations, and I do think uh, that it's going to be important for, for example, uh, our team, one of our team librarians is in charge of the state's IG program for next year, for I think 2023. And so she needs to go, she needs to attend the ILA conference. That's, and uh, Susie Wolf is on the uh, digital task force of PLA. She will need to attend PLA. I don't think that should have to be at her own expense. Well, maybe that appointment was only for a year. They're going to uh, no, I elect they, somebody else. They, no, that's not nope. how it works. Don't get by without them, for sure. Okay. Well, again, you are taking a valuable employee of the library and you're not treating her very well. But that is your choice. But it is, but again, you are one person. So I just want to be reminding the rest of the board that this is a board decision. Okay. And, uh, okay. Sue, do you have any? Uh... Um, Susan, I do have a question. In sure. reference to the PLA, you have five attendees attending that event. Could we cut that down to three individuals Certainly. rather than five? Yeah. I mean, I did cut it down from something like this. Everybody wanted to go. So I cut it down from something like 12. But yeah. Couldn't you coordinate it where you have an actual speaking presentation as we have here 
and you can actually collaborate and speak to one another what you have experienced. Yeah, we do do that. When people come back from conference, they're supposed to they have to write up all their conference notes and let everybody know what they did. But and you can have a certain presentation could. and you can provide all that information. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not, not, you know, yeah, not the same experience, obviously. You're not getting the little conversations that you have with people at a lunch or something. But yeah, we certainly could reduce that number. That is not unreasonable.
when they come back, they sure do. And they tell their um, friends and other employees about what they learned. It's not just a fluffy thing. It's an important thing for a company, a library especially. They share. I, I don't understand your thinking that, oh, let's cut this $100. Let's cut this $300. We're not, we don't send them places three and four times a year. This is one or two times, perhaps. And it's all for a reason. I, I just don't understand your to go to a different state and 
go to a conference, but when you consider the time the employee's not here and the cost, I don't know that what they learned or what conversations were had with other um, librarians is really is, is equal to what we could have accomplished by having them here working with our community. I mean, I think for this year that we are in such a bad situation, being post-COVID and everything else, I think that this would be a good year to rethink how we can build up this library. So that's why a lot of those suggestions were made. Not that we're trying to, you know, chastise anyone, but we're trying to say we need we need to focus more on our library and what's happening here as opposed to being everywhere else. Well, I th thank you for explaining your the logic behind it. I, I just have to point out that a lot of the travel outside of the library is to the north end of the district where those people don't live very close to the library. And some of those kids don't have parents that will ever bring them to the library. But when Ms. Mikey goes into the school room, those kids get to hear what the library has to offer and she gets them excited about reading and uh, it, it's a, it, I think you need both. I mean, we, we do host bus groups of kids. That is definitely one of the things we encourage that very much because I completely agree. We love to get them to come into the library and give them a tour and get them excited, but they can't all do that every year. And, you know, I think uh, my other concern would just be that if you then say, well, we're not going to deliver to the schools anymore, therefore we don't need to have a person to deliver to the schools anymore, then you cut that service effectively, and we can't just rebuild that. And many of the people in the nursing homes are up on the far north end of the district. They don't have, you know, they don't have like an employee that could do a good job of selecting materials for the residents like the people do here. They do oh. a wonderful job with that. Oh, I wouldn't want you not to select the materials. I'm saying as far as the transporting of materials from point A to point B could be done by the receiver as opposed to the library. Well, I, I think George does prefer to it being chosen by the person. But what I also wanted to mention in terms of the, is it the northwest area where is, there are children who aren't close to the library, I, I think that's that area we always talk about that we are trying to pull in more um, patrons. I'd like to see if there is some way between the Niles, um, I mean, the Niles, the free bus that runs through Niles and all of its different stops and locations, if we could coordinate, specifically coordinate dates and times for, for reasons for people in that area to be able to be picked up by that Niles bus. Maybe if it goes out of out of Niles, maybe it could be within a block. And somehow we can coordinate that. We have buses running through Niles constantly with very few people in them. And I'm sure they would appreciate we have even more riders. But I'm thinking there are there are numerous ways that we could go about this. And, and I'd like to see us focus on still getting children and patrons to the library. I understand it's important for them to see a librarian or to speak with one because their parents don't bring them here. But that's the solution we need. That's the problem we need to find a solution for. We need to get them here. And I'd like to see our focus be on that as well. Thank you. Um, I think, oh, I did have a couple. Okay, as far as, as far as the parking lanes at Culver, which you know, I've brought up numerous times, um, I, was, I would recommend that we eliminate the parking lease for 10500 per year. But I would also suggest that you come up with some alternatives for no-cost options, maybe by contacting Culver, contacting the village when we have events, and maybe we could utilize their parking spaces and it wouldn't cost the library. The library does a great deal for Culver, for the village, for many other organizations in this area and schools. And I'm looking for more reciprocation. It doesn't come with a price tag. And um, I'd like to see us consider that. Now, you mentioned something today. People were parking on the left side of the... No, well, well, I mean, I, I chair the parking committee here at the library when we had one before we entered into this contract with Culver, and we looked at all the possible options for how to handle the parking solution. I remember Mr. Bullet Bullet at one point came with a diagram of some diagonal parking spaces out here on the parkway, but I can tell you, we already ran that by the village, and they said we can't do that. So, um, 
we, we did our best to come up with some kind of a solution that was not expensive. We have, you know, Culver has traditionally been very generous with us when we need overflow parking before we had the lease. They were willing to do that, but on a day-to-day -day basis, what was, what was happening is that Linda Weiss was getting tons of telephone calls from the neighbors along Oakland Court and Oakton that staff members were coming along and parking in front of their houses. And the way it works is if you park on one side of the street, and nobody's parked across from you, it's fine, it's legal. But somebody else comes along and parks across from you that you have no control over, now you are illegally parked and the emergency vehicles cannot get through. And people were, they were annoyed at having their crosswalks blocked, their driveways blocked, so it was a huge source of irritation. So the uh, the parking lease at Culver actually really improved things a great deal. And I, I would hesitate to give it up, but that's just the background of it for those of you that But with Susan, not let's not, Let's not mistakenly bleed the new trustees. For quite some time, you mentioned you could not force staff to park across the street in the Culver parking lot because there were so many complaints about we're paying for those parking spaces and nobody's parking there. And then you mentioned they even bring doctor's notes. So the, right. fact, so that we're, can't cross so the, the fact that we're paying for parking spaces that we're not utilizing doesn't make it a logical investment. But I believe Culver wouldn't mind allowing us to park there for no fee. I mean, I think that's a conversation we should have. But I would like to see us revisit the possibilities for other parking alternatives, even with the village, in terms of whatever Mr. McCoola mentioned some time ago. I'm, I, I'm not aware of how they went, but I think we need to we need to get specifics, and we need to do something more current. And, and find out what's out there for us. Okay, well, I, I, I would not object to that by any means, and I would encourage the board members to also look for alternatives, but I would highly yes. suggest that you not break that lease before you come back and sit and reinvestigate the options. But my, my position is if you're not losing, using the parking spaces, which you are not and have not, no, that is it's not, not correct, I'm sorry. So then we've, been, we've been going around and around these parking spaces right. for years and about the fact that no one's across the street. Right. Right. Well, there is a resident who keeps monitoring that parking lot. And she keeps saying that we don't have anything. So I did finally put my foot down and say, uh, you are not allowed to park on the library grounds unless you have a note from your doctor. And you cannot park on the street. I've made people, when I've gotten a resident call, I have made people stand up and move their car right then. And so we did get uh, to the point where there were 25 to 30 cars being parked in the Culver lot every day. And what, yeah, as you say, we have, we did rent 41 spaces, so maybe we can reduce the number of spaces that we rent. But I, I would encourage the board to reach out to the Culver School Board if that's something that you want to do. Or you can talk with, we have a, a resident board member right here. But I think the procedure is board to board, isn't that how it should be done? I mean, someone explained it to me, but I forgot. It's well, it's an intergovernmental agreement, so that right. agreement is between our board and their board. And um, how did the, um, you pursued a um, moratorium. How was that handled? Um, I reached out to the superintendent of Culver and asked if it would cause them any problems with their budget if we put a pause on that on that lease while we were not using those spaces because obviously with the you know people in quarantine they didn't need parking spaces and so he took it to the board and they said sure that's fine with us. Victoria. I actually heard yep. of someone at Culver who said they would not mind um, because of whatever they're doing over there. I think there's some renovations going on um, that they would not mind if the library no longer needed those parking spaces. Okay. Well, we do have a member of the Culver School so, Board here, but she's probably not comfortable speaking. For no, not a problem. That's fine. But we should look into that. You're right. Okay. Well, I think. Um, uh, Well, that's it. That's all I have to mention. Can I just uh, speak again, please? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Becky Olson. Um, well, I would suggest, and just to continue with Susan's idea that if you want the COVID situation changed, then perhaps you, as president, should approach them and try to solve up this situation. Also, if you want three leadership conference luncheons, if you want free Night of the Roses, free Chamber of Commerce membership, then why don't 
you approach the village and ask them. You've taken and you've usurped many of um, Susan's responsibilities, yet you are throwing her these ridiculous, just ridiculous ideas. Why can't you, as president, approach? Well, to be told, we have to do it as a board. I'm only one person, remember? Okay, and as you and your board. The, the rest of the board would kind of travel. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Are there any other comments? Yes, I do get my hand up. Thank you for recognizing the gentleman. Um, yes, you're talking about not letting the staff go out of the building. They need to be here for the residents, but yet you're still planning on cutting the library hours by 20 hours a week. So therefore, the residents will not have the ability to have these staff members help them if they're not going to be here 20 hours a week. Thank you. Um, I believe, just for clarification, the decrease in hours is based on our current schedule, and I think it's based on, um, what is it, is it attendance and circulation, Joe? I forgot the term. Well, that, that's the current hours we're operating now. It's, it's, uh, okay. it's, it's increased, Joe. 54 hours. It's increased, Joe. Well, it, it is currently 54, but uh, I do recall from my last director's report, our plan has been, when we go to phase five, to go back to our previous hours, with the exception of Sunday hours for summer, going back to Sunday hours in the fall with the big kickoff event. So that was our plan, uh, based on what we, the patterns that we expect to see, we expect in the by the fall that the children may be starting to get vaccinated. And, and I have said all along, we will not see the traffic increasing hugely to the library until those kids get vaccinated and the families start coming back. That, because that is a driver of a lot of the library's activity. Right. Absolutely. But it will be happening in the fall, and I don't want to have to wait till next July. I want to read the statement. Okay. Due to low patron usage and uncertainties amidst the post-COVID world, we need financial planning that matches current patron usage and attendance. The competition to current library content and usage has gotten considerably stronger. Amazon is selling record numbers of books, subscriptions to streaming services are at all-time highs, and Google is having available more information. This budget reflects reality. When, when the facts change, we must change with the facts. Right now, our circulation is less than half of what it was in the normal year. We've been, for the last 10 years at least, the library has had declining circulation, not only Niles, but every library. Nobody's found a solution, a magic uh, bullet to bring the circulation up, and there's a lot of competition from content. Now, another thing, we are talking about uh, nursing homes. We should have somebody, either the library picks out books for them, they come and pick them up, one person can come, pick them up, be responsible for the books, see that the books get returned because sometimes in nursing homes people are there for five days, 10 days, 15 days, the books don't come back. And if they don't come back, let, let them be responsible for the books that don't come back and let's bring them back and forth. The same thing with the schools. The schools have buses for almost every school the kids have buses. The bus can bring the kids here on a field trip kids see the library, they see, they see everything that's here. The librarians can, can do a better job of, in, in some of the instances. I, I did FOIAs last, about four, three or four years ago on, on the schools and, and the teachers were only giving them 15 minutes. That's it, that's it. They would say, I've got 15 minutes here. You can come in and do the program. And then they say, well, wait, let's do it next week because you're too busy and I need to teach something because of a test or whatever. If they come to the library here, they can get maybe an hour and, and, and see everything that's here. And when the kids see it, they're gonna to say to their parents, I wanna go there, you know? So that, that's that's what I think we should do because if the kids the kids don't relate to the library, they didn't relate to what they saw in school. So if they see the library, they're gonna they're gonna to wanna to come here. 
parents to bring them here on Saturday or after school or whatever when the school is out. Um, the other, the other factor, um, you said we're, we're cutting circulate, uh, buying books. We're, the level I'm suggesting is the level we bought last year, right. because we don't have high circulation. We don't need to buy six copies of this, that, and the other. Now, when I went on a tour with you two times, there was several bins of books that were being thrown out or basically given away. I, some of the titles there, like I said I previously, I, I didn't see any titles that I would want to, I had any interest in. It looks like they're buying a bunch of turkeys and, and sitting there and they realize they don't uh, have circulation and they end up in the, in the bin there. Okay, so, you know, that's why we hire people with Masters of Library Science to study what people need and to talk to people and to, you know, have interactions with them and not everything is going to be a hit and some things are a hit for a little while, but you obviously are going to have very different tastes from, you know, from me, from Becky King Adams. You are probably not going to be checking sure. the same books yes, out. Yes. That's, if there are very few universal authors that people like. So that's why you buy across the board a wide variety of things. Anyway, that's another, another discussion. You can talk well, with Mary Kay about her selection. Well, one other suggestion I have, when they have the, um, they go to the uh, Christmas uh, Howdy Jolly event, it might be an idea for maybe the marketing people to take these bins of books and maybe sell them for a dollar a book at the at the bazaar that's going on there. Legally, can you do that? Mm -hmm. I don't think the village would be very excited, but I, that does give me the opening to say that, as a matter of fact, the, we just reopened our book sale today, as a matter of fact. Cindy and her great volunteers have done a great job of getting that all ready to go. So uh, that little room that you saw on the tour is now all cleared out. The books are out available for people to buy. Okay, being a former person who worked for one of the schools in the area, I can tell you the buses don't just belong to one school, mm -hmm. and they have to pay to drive the kids any place other than back and forth to school. Number two, Giuseppe or excuse me, Joseph, I am concerned greatly with the fact that you don't care that we might not get our grants, which she said our last grant was over 70000 because you're going to cut the hours of the library. We, the size library we have, in order to be considered for those grants, we have to be open 70 hours at least. So if you don't want our library to receive money from the government that we should and we normally get. Go ahead, Joe. Cut the hours. In response to that, Trustee Rosansky, um, I, I don't recall the total amount of the last grant, but let's say it was seventy. She just told us about a half an hour ago. Thank you. So it was seventy-six thousand dollars. We need to make sure that to receive a grant. Seventy-six thousand doesn't cost the student three times that much to receive it. So there's a lot more that goes into this than just getting a grant for X number of dollars without reevaluating the cost associated with it. That's so there's fine. much more to it than just that oh, blanket yes. statement. And of course, Joe's already made up his mind, and you can quit bid right with him. Thank you. Excuse me, Trustee Keen Adams. Would you um, like to speak about anything? Uh, yes, I was able to listen to a little bit of what at the beginning of the meeting, but I, so I'm not caught up on everything. Um, I'm a little bit confused why we're talking about outreach when that's not on the agenda, which is there. How did that? I guess it doesn't matter. Is that, you know. Trustee, I'm, I'm sorry, Director Like, you brought up many things, and I think that probably ended up all well done. So I guess first off, I'd like to say that um, things that Susan was talking about in the beginning were actually what we were given because I was reading the same thing and it didn't sound like it, it sounded very inconclusive and it was very distressing to read um, to me you know going down to 50 hours I think that there's a myriad of reasons why that is not a good idea um, one being that we could possibly not get the grant money uh, reducing hours that severely I'm not sure what the schedule and what that kind of schedule would look like but 
you know, certain people come early in the morning, others come late at night. People do come on Sundays, and especially in the summer when the kids are off, Sundays are a big day. Um, so I'm not sure how that schedule will look like with only 50 hours, but I think it would exclude a lot of people. Um, I think I heard some talk about professional development, um, and I think eliminating professional development it's like comparing apples and oranges to say that someone is a CPA and doesn't get much out of his professional development. Librarians are a different animal. Um, and by not providing opportunities for this, it's like making them become stagnant in their profession. And these are people, in some cases, that have master's degrees and have studied very hard to learn what they, what they know. And it's like, you think about that teacher you had in grade school who was really old and never went back to school to learn anything. And so no one wants to have that teacher because she doesn't know what she's talking about anymore, right? Do you want to have a librarian that doesn't know what they're talking about because they haven't been able to keep up in the profession? I don't. I don't think that's responsible. I think that is lowering the level of our professionalism and I would hate to see that. Um, you know, there are conferences all over the country that are important. They're in San Antonio, they're in Washington, and it might not be fair to compare this library to others, but I know that I was asked last week to say wherever I wanted to go, and I said send me San Antonio. So it happens. It's it's kind of an expected thing. Um, outreach. Um, a library is a community organization. We're supposed to interact with the community, not just here, but by forming partnerships with the Chamber of Commerce, uh, with the schools, with the nursing homes. People depend on us. If they can't come to us, we really do need to go to them. I think the senior citizens in particular were very vocal in the survey that you did about how wonderful it was for them to be able to receive materials during COVID because they had no other communication with the outside world. It was really a lifesaver for some of them, and it's documented by the responses they gave us. Um, as far as the schools being able to bring the kids here, I think it's not, a, I think actually I really like the idea of kids coming in to, on a field trip because then they get to see it and it's really exciting for them. I don't think it's feasible as a routine thing to not, you know, I, the buses aren't their own. Culver shares the buses with Niles West. So it's not like they can just say, okay, everyone get on the bus and go. Um, also takes a lot of time out of a teacher's day. I don't really think they would be like, okay, let's spend a half an hour getting the kids on the bus, a half an hour getting the kids off the bus, and then however much time they have here, it's just not going to fit into their schedules. So it's really, I think if that was the way we were going to go, it just wouldn't happen at all. The kids wouldn't have any opportunity to see the library in a lot of cases because their parents don't have time to bring them here. Um, and by doing that, that's cutting off their experience of what intellectual freedom is. I think it's really serious. Um, the Chamber of Commerce thing, as far as what we get out of it, um, you know, I think the, um, the program that Sasha did with the uh, discounts, you know, use your library card, this place, this place, this place. I think all those places were from the Chamber of Commerce. So if you have a library card, you can go all over town and get discounts. That's a huge benefit. I think that, um, and, and my, I don't know if I'm missing other things that were talked about, um, but it, it, it really is concerning to get all these notes it makes my stomach twist in knots for the last several days to think about the things that are being proposed. And I just want to ask all of us to maybe slow down a little bit and talk to each other about what the final outcome could look like. Because if we rush into any of these decisions, it's going to really negatively affect a lot of people, and I really don't want to do that. So, um, unless I'm missing did we go over any certain topics? Like, I know we were supposed to start with administration. Did we that's that? where we're at. So that's where we're at. Let me just check my. Yeah, all those topics. Right, Gabe, I think today. This here. Okay. Yeah. 
that was what they gave us today on the administration. Uh, I'm happy to answer any other questions you have if Carolyn wants to move on. I tell you other staff waiting to speak? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you, Trustee Keen Adams. Thank Number you. two, the next department is patient services. And the presenter for patient services is Supervisor Athena Kraus.
as well as any holes that are being sent to us from Kiva. So each, we receive about 12 to 15 bins with about 255 items per day that we need to process. They're each labeled. Um, and then we have to remove those labels and we separate them based on whether they're our material or other light grades so that we can check in efficiently rather than put everything to the sorter and tell the kids one more time we only touch it once. So these labels will pop up once we check them in, we wrap the item, and then those items are then shelved on the whole shelf alphabetically from each pick up. Um, we then have to pack these same bins at the end of each night for pick up. And in those, we would um, send out about 350 items per day. Um, again, those are items that patients are either returning to us, things we return back to their home library, or items that we've retrieved from the pick list. So for the pick list, we have to run it one time per day minimum for CCS rules Monday through Saturday. Um, we have, um, during the peak of the pandemic, we often saw in the list over 500 items per day, and it also reached up to 1,600. Um, so our request for materials is in high demand. We have come up with a system where we run it multiple times per day so that our patrons do not have to wait a long time. Um, so locating, we check them in, or trapping, which will either um, let us know if it's going out to another library, in which case we have to label each item with a routing tag, pack the movement, or again, put the label on it. From January to April, we pulled an average of 5,889 items per month with a pickup location of Niles or CCS, another CCS library. Um, we're also in charge of passport services. Um, our associate one to handle that. We haven't been able to do passports since mid-March. Um, in order to be eligible to be a passport acceptance facility again this year, each one of us needed to go through recertification training which we were at about 95% complete for most of us. So I have submitted the necessary paperwork to the Department of State for those of us who are um, finished with our recertification training. So they do require at least 30 days notice. So like I said, that has been um, filed with them. So I do anticipate us to be able to resume either mid-June or July. I believe this service is going to be in high demand based on calls weekly multiple calls weekly from our patrons, and that the fact that the post office now is requiring appointments only, and their appointments are about a couple months out. Um, and from year to year that we did offer service, our numbers steadily increased. So um, in order to calculate the staffing levels for when resuming the passport service, I compared the months of June 2018 through February 2019 to those of June 2019 and February 2020. This passport service was up 32% on average each month. So I took that number and at minimum can come up that we will average about 185 passports per month. But again, I do believe that this number will be higher. So what does this mean financially for the library? Each passport that we execute, we receive $35. So if I took this number and multiplied it by 35, we would receive about $6,400 per month or $77,000 per year. But this would only be um, if I can have the appropriate staffing levels. During peak times, we would often have four um, passport agents executing applications. At this time, I believe we would only be able to have one to two with the staffing level that I currently have. I'm also in charge of notary service. We have five notaries in my department, one in adult services and one in kids space. This is also a very popular service that patrons are requesting almost daily. So I am anxious to get that back. Um, so we do notarize on average about 120 sheets per month for patrons. Um, most are one to two minutes interactions, but we have had um, times when it could take us well up to 30 minutes to have one interaction with the patron. So again, this would depend upon our staffing levels and how well we are able to meet the needs of our community. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, Start with questions. Um, Mr. McCooley, do you have any questions? Uh, yes. I, I didn't understand all of what you were talking about the bins. My idea was that if we got some more of the bins on wheels, we could roll them to the departments where the books belong, and when 
people working in those departments you have nothing to do, just like when you go into Menards or Home Depot or Jewel, people are stocking the shelves. They're not sitting at, at a desk waiting for somebody to ask questions. And then you have to go in the aisle and find that person. So I think they could do some of the shelving of the books. And we would not double handle these books by just taking the carts right over to those departments instead of sorting them out and, and you know, double, triple handling the stuff. Because it's, it's very labor intensive and, and that's our biggest expense here, is labor. So if we can try that out maybe, the cost of the carts is not anywhere near what, what the savings could be. So it could be something you should try out and see if, it, if it's more effective because we've got other people in the departments that are not not busy at times. Well, that, that's what I want to speak to. There is never a time when people are not busy. There's never a time when somebody is just standing there waiting for somebody to come. They are always either reading book review journals, to be ordering materials for the collection, working on their programs, preparing materials for their programs. Nobody is ever standing around waiting for anybody. That just does not happen in this library. And the other thing I wanted to say is, uh, while I understand, I don't like touching things multiple times either. Right? That's one of the efficiency things that we have tried. And I think Athena's crew does a great job. But you take a bin that's got things in it for a kid space, say. So you might have a picture book on top, and that's in this corner of the department. And then you've got a Korean book, and that's on that corner of the department. And then you've got, you know, it's, it's a big department, and they're running all over the place. It's much more efficient to put them all in order first well, and then just go in order through the department. You know and then you're having high-paid people do that work instead of the low-paid people do that work. You know work. what? The bins are about two and a half feet by two and a half feet. You don't take one book out. You look in there, you can see six or seven titles that go in the same area. You take them there, you come back, you get six or seven that go to some, some other area. It, it wouldn't be one book at a time. Okay. It would, it would, we, we could I'd say it's worth giving a try. Trial. We, could, we could see, I'm sure. That it's worth giving a try. Set up some kind of a trial, but I'm, I'm just warning you, to me that idea does not seem practical. You know what, if you don't try anything, nothing ventured, nothing gained. Okay, so, you know. But I just want to reiterate, there is never a time when the staff is not doing anything. It does not happen. Well, if, I don't know how many, you know. I don't know. Sure uh, once these programs are developed, are we continually developing programs? Uh, yeah, uh, pretty much. We don't do the same story hour every week. Obviously, they're, different they're, story hours. they're not writing the story, they're just reading the book, so it's not that much. Production. See, there, there's a lot about that program planning that you don't know. And we'd be happy to spend some more time on that. Uh, okay. That's, that's basically what, uh, what I have. Also, the uh, I think the hall week reader is on this department. Uh, I, we do, do we still have a hall week reader full time, or is that gone? Mostly done by volunteers at this point. By who? Volunteers. Okay. All right. Are, do we have the volunteers back ready? Yes. A few? Yes. Oh. Yep. She called them back, I think, the beginning of May. Was it? It's been a while. Um, the back. Okay. Um, yeah, the volunteers started reading um, the beginning of May, maybe the last week in April. Okay. As soon as the
Trustee Rosansky. Yeah. Joe, you've never worked in a library yet. Excuse me, that, that's not That's true. just a question for Joe. Excuse because me, I have, yeah, and I know what's involved with shelving. Trustee Rosansky, please. Okay, I'm sorry, Joe. Forgive me. I asked you a question. Can we move on? Yes, if you let me. Passport, you're saying are probably going to start up again in June? Uh, the end of June and the beginning of July. Okay. Um, and you're kind of short staffed now. So people are making reservations. Uh, there's not a lot you can do except two at a time, then, like you said? At maximum, yes. Okay, thank you. I am just um, really impressed with the wealth of services that you provide and that you do and your department does. I didn't know that you had all these responsibilities. Uh, thank you for giving us this information. It's astounding that people think we have nothing to do. Um, people used to say that about the pandemic. You know why the library is closed, but so why are we paying the staff? The library is closed. There, there is. I, I don't I understand how people think. People. No, I won't go there. But, um, just thank you for your hard work and for everything.
at all? Or you I said thank you. Oh, yes, thank you. Okay. Um, I just have a couple of questions, Athena, and, and um, actually um, regarding Trustee King Adams' comment about doing passports in the boardroom is a really good idea. I thought we had a passport office. Am I saying something? No, we do, but in order to uh, process passport applications, we require that they have to remove their masks so that we can verify their identity. So it's a social identity. distancing issue, right? Uh, yes, yeah. mm -hmm. exactly. If we have a family of four plus staff, they need to remove their masks for us to view them. Oh, so for larger passport requests, you'll use uh, the boardroom, but we'll still be using the passport office? No, not at all. We can do that for smaller individuals. No, no, I'm just asking. No, I'm trying to understand your plan. I'm not asking you to change it for me. I'm just trying to understand. So you're going to just switch to the boardroom to handle that. Is that what the plan was? I wasn't aware of it. Uh, so I wrote this up during the time before things had started to stabilize. So if uh, things continue to progress in a good fashion, we can go back to the passport office. Oh, oh no, but I understand. I totally understand yeah. the reasoning. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. No, that's fine. And then I have a question. Um, you were mentioning the number of returns and wasn't sure I was totally understanding. I think you said something like 5,988 believed returns from January through April. Are those books that came back to us or does this have something to do with CCS? I wasn't sure what that number represents. Sure, it's going to be a combination of both okay. that you're physically checking in that would have to be reshelled. Okay, and, and that was for the from January through April, there were 5,988. Is that what the total? Um, so in January, we received 19,805, and in April, we received 30,847 names back. Okay, so I'm not sure what 5,988 was for, but again, um, are these were these returns due to the fact the library was closed and you weren't accepting returns? So the drop-off, I thought we shut down the drop-off. Am I mistaken? That was, that was prior. Prior, so. The, sh the, uh, uh, the server was shut down for a while, and then we had books being delivered and entered this door right here. Okay, but they uh, were still. Okay. And um, it, that was brought up, I believe, in uh, July or maybe June last year, if you remember. And then it was open the entire time. Okay, then I just I was just confused about COVID and, and how it affected us when and where. Okay, yeah, right, I mean right. the biggest the biggest deal there was that we actually had to use this room to quarantine materials for a number of days before they could be put through the sorter, so we wouldn't contaminate the sorter. Um, and that and at that point in time, that was a that was a big deal that Rails had broadcast to you know everybody in the system. So. We followed the rails recommendations, and as time passed, the quarantine, uh, the period of time for quarantine shrank. Yes. And so I think it was just, did that get down to just a day? Yes, 24 hours. So it did get down to just a day, yes. and then yes. ultimately they removed it all together when they got confidence that the uh, virus was not transmitted through uh, books or materials. Right, right. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, well then, uh, well, at least those numbers are. Are, are more representative of what these months did, uh, what books were returned during these months. Um, I, think, I think that was all I had. I want to thank you for for coming this evening. You're the first staff person on the first day, so I know how um, intense that is, but thank you so very much. Ms. Jubilee, can I just ask one more question? Oh, please. Right. Just quickly. I just noticed that Better. Um, again, on memberships and subscriptions, could you tell me reaching forward and the, the pony workshops, those are the two uh, professional development activities that your department attends? Can you, can you tell me a little bit about their significance and what exactly? Sure. So, reaching forward is basically all library staff conference. So, it goes anywhere shelter opportunities to learn all the way up to admin so that would be one and then Lucona usually offers a lot of circulation and customer service type programs for us so that's being the front line and the first and last piece of the building can I do get one more question also? 
what, what do you think it would look like, say, in August, if we didn't get people to fill those positions? What, what would the result be? Uh, so I think we would not be able to um, offer the level of service that we currently do to our teachers. Um, with the more workload that we would be um, having put upon us, and I think we would have um, pretty tired staff and run down. It is a pretty physical job. Yeah, it reminds me of another question. Was like, how do you feel? I mean, I guess this is your opinion. I guess we have to realize that we're just talking opinions here. But how would staff feel about having a professional? If patient service our needs kind of says it all, that's what we strive to do. So not having these opportunities to learn new techniques and to deal with the current times, such as the compassion to see and how to deal, um, I think that would be a great impact. Thank you. Material staffing, professional development, memberships and subscriptions, and then any other thing. The fire department, I just want to make there sure were, that there were track. five okay. pages, Perfect. I believe, that were um, critiqued, and I thought that um, those same pages would be helpful if the departments you know, voiced their concerns and yes. shared information. I just have one question for you. Yes. We did request that public relations be separated from marketing so we could get a better handle on what happens in what department, but I see these pages are are still uh, combining both. So we don't have separation of public relations. I'm sorry, Trustee, are you talking about the program? Um, well, any of the any of the plus that are associated on these five pages were called public relations and marketing. So we ask that they be separated, um, public relations and all that that entails, and marketing and all that that entails better idea. So were, were you unable to do that for us um, for tonight? No, so what I have for you there is it's, it's a single sheet that um, has a few, well, I get two things. One is all the program information. The other um, is uh, a list of the duties that we do in regards to public relations. Everybody received a single okay. copy of that. Yes. yes. So then programming expenses and um, let's see, we have professional development, authors and much and subscriptions, but for example, promotional, like is that all marketing? 
Yeah, so I'm sorry, can you find, I just want to make sure that you're, that you have, I need to pass out to everybody all of the program information. There's a single sheet that says public relations at the top. I just want to make sure that everyone is. So that's the only one for public relations? Yes, yeah, so public relations. Um, yeah, I'm sure I have it. Okay, so public relations, uh, I can't really associate a cost besides my time when it comes to public relations. I would not consider any special events uh, or let's say the promotional items that I have requested for next year's budget to have to do with public relations in particular. Public relations, uh, you know, at, at, the, at the most basic level is my communication with the local media outlets. Right. And I indicate there, there are three main, two more main than the third, but um, we uh, usually communicate with the Niles Journal and Topics. There's also the Niles Herald Spectator, there's also the Bugle. The Bugle has changed, I'm not even sure if it's called Niles Bugle anymore, there's not much Niles in it, so that's what I'm saying, they're the, 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 the least that we communicate with. Uh, that would be in regards to print media. Uh, there are some online outlets, there is a website called Niles Patch, where we can post our own press releases and communications there. There are a couple Facebook groups that we at times engage in. One is called Everything Niles. The other one is called Niles Area Open for Business, uh, where we post, where we, where we, we don't post as much now, but we used to post uh, during, uh, you know, and the earlier on in the pandemic to uh, whoever was in that group just to notify them of any changes that were going on in the library. So I would not consider, as I said, public relations, um, in any which way, specifically to any of the other items that I have requested in this budget. Okay, so then all these other documents are strictly marketing, even though they say PR and marketing. PR and marketing, I mean, just in the industry itself, not library industry, but public relations and marketing industry. I mean, there are blends, that's why you see them a lot next to each other. Uh, the word doc or the document that I provided to everyone is specifically, I mean, there's not much to it besides keeping the media informed of right. program services. If they have any questions, any financial questions, they'll they'll call and get clarification pre or post the board meeting and such. I mean, sure. that's basically our public relations. Well, I was interested in getting this information because I mentioned uh, when we met here last week Wednesday, the purpose is to understand what it is that you do for PR because maybe once we know what you do, we could come up with additional ideas or different avenues to um, to utilize for our libraries, uh, getting its word out and, and what have you. So that this is really helpful. Thank you. Sure. All right. All right. Now to start off with the uh, one through five. So the first one is programs. So everyone received um, all of the documents with the program information that was requested. Uh, my apologies ahead of time. They are in order of update, but these top ones, I apologize if they weren't in the exact order. Um, our plan for fiscal year 2021-22 is to, uh, well, I probably should mention another thing. The Public Relations and Marketing Department does not technically put on any programs, so to speak, like the other departments, but the Public Relations and Marketing Department is responsible for special events. So the four that are listed here are uh, special events that we would like to host uh, in the next fiscal year. Uh, the first one we have here, um, I'm not sure if you did, I'm gonna look at what Greg sent out, is that okay? The first one is a library card sign-up event. And I, you know, all, all of these bigger events are subject to reopening if things go backwards. I mean, you know, it's, it's tough to, to predict much with, you know, the situation in the world today. Uh, but in regards to the library card sign-up event, we were thinking either something in the fall or potentially in the spring. We've, we have had great success with taking the library card sign-up event on the road. And when I say on the road, don't think that we had a tour bus or anything like that. It was literally me and one of my associates going to Golf Mill and having a table and hosting a an event at Golf Mill. The last one that we did, uh, which you will see in in, in the uh, the pieces of paper that I that I gave you with everything laid out. The last time we did a library card sign-up event was in 2019, 
and we it was a petting zoo that we brought to Golf Mill. It was very, very well attended. We were able to sign up uh, residents for library cards. There was even individuals that, or I should say residents, that specifically came to Golf Mill. They didn't care about the animals. They just came to sign up for a library card. So it was great to, to receive that feedback and see that uh, our residents were interested in coming to the event, whether it was just to sign up for a library card or to actually enjoy the event itself. Uh, so I have here uh, $500 budgeted for that event, and uh, what I have in the budget compared to what I have in the piece of paper that I gave you, that is just the cost of, of the event itself. So if we're bringing a petting zoo bag, we're bringing a magician, something to uh, bring attention to have our residents come to the event. Um, the second one we have here is Winter Palooza. Now, Winter Palooza uh, is basically our winter reading kickoff. We have a summer reading program. We also have a winter reading program, uh, and it has been a very, 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 very popular event. When I think about, when I look at the pictures and think back at how many people were in this library, and I think about the life we're living today, it is hard. <laughs> it is hard for me to fathom how. Many people were here, but uh, the last time that we had it in December of 2019, um, I believe we had probably five, probably, I think it was a little over 500 attendees. And we had Elsa from Frozen, they did a story time and a sing-along, we had crafts, um, and it was a very, very, very exciting event. And whoever came uh, was able to learn about the winter reading program. So I have budgeted the same amount uh, as I did in December of 2019, which is $800, which would cover the costs of uh, the entertainment and uh, the craft supplies. We have over here also, you know, this is very, very forward thinking because it would be in a year from now, <laughs> which is the summer reading kickoff for next year. Uh, we have budgeted $1,500. Uh, we consider the summer reading program the biggest program that this library offers. Uh, it is for all ages, uh, the reading program itself. The, uh, uh, I mean, all of our events are you know, open to the public and you know, if you're in all ages, I suppose. Uh, so this one in particular for the 1500 would be similar to Winter Palooza. It would be entertainment. It would be craft supplies. I'm saying craft supplies now, but it could be some sort of other activity where we would need to purchase materials exactly you know, a year ahead of time, those details, but this is kind of the system that we've done in the past few years for um, the summer reading kickoff. And last but not least is actually a return of a past event that we have not had in many, many years. I'm not even sure, maybe even 10 years. Uh, so you will see in my information to you, I do not have a cross comparable from you know, 10 years ago for this one, but Super Sunday after the summer reading kickoff would probably be the net, at that time, was uh, probably our second biggest event. Uh, we would like to do Super Sunday again with, um, you know, the thought that we would be open again on Sundays. Uh, the premise of Super Sunday back in the day was um, the library used to be closed from Memorial Day to Labor Day on Sundays. So this would be the first Sunday of, of in September that it would be called Super Sunday and it would be this open house and welcome, welcome back. So we are hoping to do the same. So it would be, I believe, September 12th-ish is, is the first Sunday uh, after Labor Day. So similar to the rest of these events, the, 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 the funds are to, to fund the event itself so that we have something to offer our residents. So those are the four special events. Alrighty, so number two is materials. I do not purchase any materials, so we'll be moving on to number three, which is staffing. Uh, the, current, the current staffing structure, and we've had this staffing structure, I'd probably say maybe for the past six years. It is a department of four. There are three full-timers, myself, graphic designer, public relations and marketing coordinator, and we also have a part-time multimedia assistant. 
I would say without the public relations and marketing department, there is zero communication in this community about what the library has to offer. We have school liaisons. We have board members that could promote what's going on in the library and so forth. But the sole purpose of the public relations and marketing department is to make sure that our taxpayers are aware of the programs that we offer, the services, the events, and so forth. Um, my role uh, as supervisor is to uh, oversee the department. I am heavily involved in every aspect of the department. I truly enjoy my job. I truly enjoy being creative. I truly enjoy, um, and I can speak for my staff as well, many of the staff members have been with us for many, many years. Um, I think it is important to mention that I have been at this library for over 16 years. And you're probably thinking that I started working here when I was nine. Yes, no, the math, the math does <laughs> add up. The math, the math does add up. Um, and I've been in the marketing department for over 13 years. Our graphic designer has been here for six plus years. Our public relations and marketing coordinator three plus years, and our multimedia system two plus years. So, um, you know, I talked about myself. So the graphic designer is obviously she is responsible for most of the graphics that you see in this library. Starting with the first one being the newsletter. She designs it from front cover to back cover. Uh, we uh, receive uh, most of the copy that goes into the newsletter from the programmers. Uh, we do not put together that information, the times and dates and the description of the program, but any besides the program information, every, every other word that you see in that newsletter is written by the Public Relations and Marketing Department. Besides Susan's letter, I should say. I did not write Susan's letter. <laughs> so besides that, everything else comes from my department. Um, I, I am extremely blessed to have someone, her name is Annette, who is our graphic designer. She has been a graphic designer for, I believe, over 25 years, and she is truly amazing with what she comes up. And I am extremely proud of the graphics that she does for this library. Uh, the Public Relations and Marketing Co Coordinator assists with um, some of my duties in regards to writing the press releases. She is in charge of our social media presence. She is in charge of updating the website. And she also helps with the special events that I mentioned earlier. Our multimedia assistant, who is um, uh, the part-timer in the department, she works 18 hours a week. And I have to say that uh, you know, COVID being such an uncertain time, and I think we've learned a lot of great things. We've learned a lot of great things about ourselves, about our staff members, all of the skills that we have in a time of need. And I have to say that without Anna Marie, we would not have uh, all of the videos that you see on YouTube of virtual programs that she goes through the process after they are done to edit them and do all the post-production that comes with that to make sure that if a patron was not able to come to one of the programs, they're able to watch it on demand on our YouTube channel. Um, I believe it was in the March board pack, and I, understand, and I know we have um, some new trustees who most likely did not read it, but I did a year in review of marketing's contributions during COVID. And Anna Marie in particular, who is our multimedia assistant, has edited, has, I should say, post-produced um, over 120 videos since the pandemic started. And if you are not familiar with video editing and video production, there is a lot of work that goes in it. You have, and, and many of these files are ginormous and they take a long time to download, to upload, to edit, and then to go into the post-production phase of rendering. And then you have to upload it to YouTube. I, you know, I, um, I have not done a video in quite some time, but I did the special board meeting, and oh my God, it took like eight hours, you know, <laughs> just in the background, because it was just, it's, it's, it was a long meeting, and um, even in her short 18 hours, she is able to slice through, slice through those and make sure that they are up for the patrons. Um, that is all that I have on staff. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so number four is professional development. Uh, my department, just like every other department in this library, values having the opportunity to attend professional development either conferences, workshops, webinars, whatever the case may be, every little bit of knowledge will help us be better staff members, better employees, so we can serve this community. 
Uh, what I have budgeted here is a thousand, one thousand dollars, one thousand forty-five, and um, the PR workshops and conferences. There are a couple um, very popular uh, conferences that we have done in the past that have been very beneficial. Uh, one is called uh, Digital Summit, which is actually going to be in as of right now in person in October, uh, and uh, in Chicago. So there's not plane travel, just, just getting, into, getting into the city, uh, where we can learn about what's new in the digital marketing world and what we can bring back to this library so we can be more efficient and effective. Uh, another conference, which they did uh, announce recently will be virtual, uh, is uh, the annual Library Marketing and Communication Conference. And I have to say that I enjoy going to that more than any other conference because it's specific to my craft and I learn a lot from going to them. And you know, I have to say, someone like myself who is a supervisor where I am involved in everything in my department, I, you know, I have to produce uh, you know, monthly reports for the board packets and, and do my supervisory duty. It is very beneficial to go to a conference for one day, two day, three day get the jam-packed version of all the things that you need to learn because I can speak for myself. I don't have a lot of time to do the webinars. I, I'm a sad soul who signs up even for the free ones and they come and they send me the thing after. It's like, you didn't make it, you didn't come to it. And I just don't find the time in you know my 40 hours, which I mean, I'm salary, so it's usually more than that, uh, to uh, devote to a webinar here, or a workshop here. But when I can go to a conference and get the jam-packed version of everything I need to know, it is extremely, extremely beneficial. Uh, the last thing here, similar to Athena, is the Reaching Forward Conference, which she um, spoke on that and explained. I believe the 150 is to send one of my staff members to that. And typically it's in May, it's in Rosemont. There is no airfare. It is you're basically just paying for um, the conference fee and mileage to get there. All right, number five, memberships and subscriptions. Um, there is only one um, uh, membership due that, or yeah, membership due that I have, and it is to the Illinois Library Association for $150. Uh, that $150 not only does it give me a discount on their annual conference, but I am heavily involved in what's called the Illinois Library Association Marketing Forum. I was the forum manager for two years, a couple years ago, and I'm still a board member. And we, uh, there's probably about six, seven, eight of us who work in libraries in Illinois, and we come together to, uh, to we come together to come up with uh, some uh, professional development, uh, I shouldn't say professional development, there is a monthly, now it's virtual, a monthly networking group. So we come together to see what the topic should be for that uh, networking group. We also uh, run a very, 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 very successful saying very, very, very many times. It is called a mini conference, which is much bigger than a mini conference, where, where um, we, uh, we invite speakers from different organizations uh, to talk about marketing to, to, to us library marketers. So without this $150, I will not, and I should mention that, I will not be able to serve on this committee without this $150. If you're not a member of ILA, you are not allowed to serve on any of their committees. Uh, number six is promotional. Um, okay. So, uh, as you can see here on the left-hand side, Excuse I, me, I'm sorry. Uh, I just want to point out that uh, after uh, item five, you know, there were three or four items that I added, and I just numbered them sequentially following it. I know that you didn't have numbers associated with them, but I didn't think I couldn't think of a way to present them that was logical. All righty, thank you. Um, so uh, just to kind of so it's easy to see kind of the broader spectrum of what I'm asking for here on the left hand side in bold. Um, so, I'm sorry, Trustee Dribbuk, if you, can, if you can help me. Am I going line by line of every one of these, or am I giving an overview and other questions? You're on number six promotional. Yes. I'm following your okay, perfect. Uh, so, just to kind of go over, um, 
you know, I'll try to kind of get through this. Um, so we have advertising, and I have to say, we don't do any advertising like in, in the newspaper or in magazines. I don't want the thought of advertising being that we are, you know, doing ginormous billboards in 294 or anything like that. Um, they are basically the two things that you see here, the first one being social media ads. Um, one thing that I want to mention uh, that was in my narrative, uh, there are many, many, many marketing tools that we use. Oops, I told everyone I had a time to go close, and now I went too close. Um, my apologies. Uh, my, uh, my mentor told me when I started in library marketing, she said, she's like, Sasha, marketing is like a pinball machine. You pull the lever, and the little ball hits all those different areas. And that is, all those areas are marketing tools, whether they be the newsletter, social media, website, email marketing, posters in the library, posters in the community, those are all touch points. And believe it or not, you can't see one touch point and be like, voila, I'm gonna go to the library. Sometimes you have to see the same program. Uh, you know, the reminder of getting a library card with the campaign that we did, the best deal ever campaign. Uh, keep getting that reminder to see the importance of getting a library card, for example. So when it comes to social media ads, uh, so we have, uh, there are probably three or four, I would say Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube would probably be our uh, social media platforms that we communicate with our residents the most. And uh, I would say Facebook, and uh, Facebook in particular, but then there's also Instagram where once upon a time when Facebook first started is you would put a post and everybody would see it. And as time went on, in order for more people to see it, you have to do what's called boosting the post. And boosting, boosting the posts, I mean, are relatively inexpensive. I mean, it's not thousands of dollars. You can boost the post for $5. You can boost it for 10, 20. I don't think we've ever done anything more than probably 20, maybe $50 if it was something that was very, very important that we spread the word on. So what I'm asking for here is $500 for the whole fiscal year where we could potentially boost at least two or three of our messages to our followers and beyond. Uh, what's great with the social media ads is you can choose the age range, you can choose the zip codes, um, you can even choose interests. I mean, there's, there's a lot of detail there. So that's where social media ads are. Um, I, I'm not sure if it's mailed out. I know that we have it here at the library, but the chamber just came out with their annual guide. And we are featured, um, Trustee McCool, I read some of your comments earlier. We, I think they do charge for that, for that publication guide, whatever you want to call it. Um, uh, they do charge to be featured in there. And we are lucky enough that they gave us half a page have a page which I just say is an article, so not even just like an ad, an article that talks about why the library card is the best deal ever. There's a picture, it's beautiful, um, I think they did a great job with the guide, so that is actually an example of the chamber giving us our, a platform for free. Is this, what is this guide? Is this something they mail out to everybody in Niles, or is this something that just is presented to the uh, people at the events? I think well, I mean, the chamber would have to speak on that. I feel, I think that it is mailed out to every resident in Iowa. If you want to have, a, like, uh, to the Roses uh, event, they have a booklet and sponsors. And exactly. Booklet, and that's what I believe this is about. Correct, correct. And the only people that see that are the ones that attend that event. I, be, I believe that there, I'm not sure, I think that the guy, I'm sorry, that you're talking specifically, which is what this 250 is for, uh, is to be featured in the Niles Night of Roses guide. I do believe that it is posted online as well. I'm not sure, I don't work for the chamber, but um, I think it might be a little bit more than just who attends there, but that is exactly what I'm asking for here for the 250. Um, in regards to community engagement, um, we, we, we do a lot of community things. I mean, every department does a, a great load of community engagement in some way or some which way or another. Um, I would say from all this community engagement lines here, uh, the most expensive is going to be the 4th of July parade. Uh, when I put together my budget, similar to Athena, it was a few months ago, with the understanding of the parade may happen, it may not happen, and we heard last week that it will be happening. So I uh, budgeted year $2,000 that I typically budget year after year, which covers the costs of our of 
what we need to participate in the parade, but also we are probably one of the most popular attractions at Grand Heights Park after after uh, after the parade. Um, we have we bring the same games that we have in our department. Bring both. Sorry, sir. The uh, parade is not going to be at the park at all. It's just going to be correct. Parade. I don't I don't know if you're aware. I am aware, sir. Um, but I was explaining that when I put these numbers together, it was with the assumption that things would be like normal. Thank you. Uh, so what the, specifically, I think that was a question that was on, on, on one of the sheets. What goes into the $2,000? So what goes into the $2,000 is staff members are encouraged to participate in the 4th of July parade. Sometimes they come with their little kids, their family members, and we get t-shirts. So we have one uniform, unified look. Uh, the $2,000 also covers, uh, sometimes we, one year we passed out fans because it can be very, very hot at the 4th of July. Uh, sometimes we are just throwing candy into the crowd, uh, but also the $2,000 covers uh, any prizes we buy for the games for, as I mentioned, a very, very popular attraction at the Grand Heights Park. So yes, Trustee McCullough, things are different now, that, that's not the case. But um, I'm just explaining the number that I put in originally. Uh, we have also here uh, the Village of Niles has like a new resident. Um, I call it buckets because they moved from I'm not sure what it was before, but now Home Depot donated those giant orange buckets. So, um, so with that said, uh, what we had some leftover mugs from uh, one of the winter reading programs, and we have been. Uh, giving those mugs as what a new resident would see in the buckets. If you've been to Home Depot, if you've seen them, they are very deep, and I feel like if we put this pen in there, nobody would care and nobody would look. But I can tell you, we all drink coffee, we all drink tea, we all drink water. I'm pretty sure that those new residents are taking great advantage of the mugs that are in there. So uh, we are running out of those mugs. Um, we actually just did a, a round of uh, new resident buckets uh, where we gave the mugs. So that amount is to get more mugs. Uh, we have over here back to school every year, uh, the school liaison, particularly in the elementary school grade. Um, when she visits the schools, whether it's registration day or when she goes and visits them um, uh, for library day or class visits, uh, we like to get a practical promotional item that the students could use throughout the school year. So every time they go in their backpack and pick up this promotional item, they remember the library. Our name is on there, our logo, our brand. So uh, $800 is for, for um, uh, back to, uh, uh, a back-to-school promotional item. I do also have here pens, notepads to have uh, for, you know, we hope with things reopening that we will, you know, be able to go into the community more and uh, be able to uh, pass out pens or notepads, just some something that our residents can, can leave our table, besides hearing all the wonderful information of, of the library, um, that they could leave with a promotional item as well. We have over here the holiday outdoor decor that is the professionally installed uh, holiday decor that's outside the library. Um, you know, that includes wrapping up the trees that are by the, uh, the veteran benches. I think we also have like a wreath and a garland on the front, so that's what that cost goes to. Library cards, very obvious, it's to make sure that we always have library cards on hand. We do have three different kind of library cards. We have an adult version, teen version, and a kid version. Uh, on the next page, merchandise, I have over here tote bags, flash drives, earbuds. So we do sell, uh, we started selling tote bags when we stopped giving out plastic bags as a way for if a uh, card holder is checking out a lot of materials. We don't want those materials to be damaged. We don't want anything to, to, to go wrong with the materials. So that we like having the option that they can purchase a tote bag with our branding on it that they can use for groceries. I mean, there's nothing multi use for that. Uh, flash drives and earbuds are uh, sold downstairs in our digital services uh, area by the tech desk. And that, uh, the flash drives and earbuds are mainly for if you're working on a project in our digital media studio and you need to save it for you know, whatever reason, uh, saving a document, uh, working on a resume and so forth, you can purchase a flash drive. And then earbuds, you know, obviously since we um, 
I don't think, I don't, I'm not sure if there's any speakers down there. So in case you want to hear something that you're watching on YouTube or something like that, to have the earbuds. Um, I would talk on the summer reading program and winter pr reading program collectively. So, uh, and this is actually probably something I should have explained from, from the beginning. A lot of what you see in promotional, uh, like the merchandise, I don't sell the merchandise, but I do purchase the merchandise because it has a branding on it. So it does go through me. So I don't sell it. I don't do any of the, you know, when it comes here, I give it to whoever needs to see it exactly. Just to um, and, you know, when they need more, they come back and they ask me. Uh, so uh, for the summer reading program, you know, you'll see a lot of similar things here. So I think for the youth, teen, and adult branded prizes, like I said, everything that has our logo comes through my department to get purchased. So uh, I think once you meet a certain goal in the summer reading program, you do get uh, one of these prizes. You know, so that so that is uh, that is that. Uh, there is also here um, uh, we have a lot of volunteers. I know Olivia you mentioned that you used to be a volunteer for the summer reading program. Um, as a little token of our appreciation, I believe the last time we got water bottles for them with the library logo on them. Not only are they drinking those, drinking out those water bottles when they're working at those desks, um, you know, checking in the, the readers and such, but they will also use that branded item in the community, maybe when they're going to the park district, uh, a basketball game or, or whatever the case may be. So um, we would like to be able to give them something as a token of our appreciation. Uh, winter reading is, is I, I mean, you really can't even compare it to the giantness of uh, summer reading, so that's why you only see three items here, which uh, youth services and teen services, they ask for lanyards every year. Uh, the winter reading logs um, are like a little postcard, and there's a hole punch in them, and these lanyards are for easy, so you don't lose the card, so you put the lanyard on it, so you can easily take out your backpack or wherever it may be. And then um, for the adult residents, um, or I'm sorry, the adult readers, um, a branded price for them as well. That is number six. Okay. All right, number seven, printing. Um, okay. So uh, probably the, you know, I, I, I um, probably the, yeah, not probably the most expensive thing uh, in, in the printing budget is the first item, which is the library newsletter. Um, I do have to say that the library newsletter has, uh, you know, evolved over the years. Uh, you know, back in the day when I started, it was a, it, it definitely looked different, but uh, the frequency was also different. I would say since our focus groups that we did um, for um, uh, the company, the company, uh, uh, the consultant, I should say, that, that did the focus groups, we heard a lot of um, feedback that they wanted to see, they wanted to get something from the library in the mail more frequently. At that time, we were doing 16 pages four times a year. From receiving that feedback, uh, wanting to um, meet the goals of our community, we uh, moved to six times a year at 16 pages. So, uh, you know, every newsletter is two months. Uh, so what we are hoping for, um, since our last 16 page newsletter was sent out right before the pandemic started, it was our April, May 2020 issue. After that, we scaled back to save costs uh, by doing eight pages instead of 16 pages. So we are, uh, everyone should have received in the mail recently, probably last week, our June and July newsletter. It is still eight pages. Our hope is that August, September, which uh, the copy for that is due actually this Friday from all the programmers, will continue to be eight pages. But we're hoping with being on the other side of this pandemic that we can go back to normal and offer a 16 page newsletter every two months. So that is what this um, dollar amount is for, just the printing. Uh, summer reading here has a lot of different uh, uh, options here, um, just to kind of speak you know, as, as, as brief and just kind of to the point as possible. 
uh, the youth services summer reading program is very, very robust, and it is uh, definitely where we get the highest number of participants. Um, the first thing here you see is summer reading folders. So we call it folders, but I don't want anyone in, in the audience to think that it is a folder with like the two pockets inside or anything <laughs> like that. Um, and I'm not sure it would be a win when you were doing it, how they looked or anything like that, but basically it is an 11 by 17 sheet that's folded in half, and it has um, a way for the readers to track their reading, and after they read X amount of, I mean, sometimes they change it, so I'm just gonna go with this story that, you know, after you track how many books or how many minutes, sometimes it's even how many times you've actually visited the library that week, um, you can come in and play the summer reading game. So think of it more as a log, than a folder. Uh, the youth services flyers are uh, similar information to what we have in the newsletter for the summer issue. It is all the programs that youth services puts on in the summer, and these flyers are uh, designed and printed, and they pass them out to the student to the students before the school year ends. So on their last visit to the schools, they pass out these flyers as a promotion of summer reading and also promotion of all the programs that are offered uh, by, by the library in the summer. Uh, these uh, youth services postcards, when, you, when I say postcards, do not think that they get mailed. They're just a postcard size. It's just a brief promotion for the kids to take home with their, uh, to their parents to um, encourage them to sign up their kids for summer reading. Uh, there is a game component to summer reading, and that has also evolved from years past to what it is right now. Right now, we have um, a giant dry erase board, and we uh, do outsource this aspect of it because we do not have uh, equipment here to take care of this part, where they print a giant board game on vinyl, and uh, that vendor comes and um, puts the line along the dry erase board. There is a technique to that, believe it or not. Uh, I don't know how many times I failed putting that plastic thing on my phone and all those oh, bubbles. Yeah, so right. they are, there are no bubbles, I can promise you that, um, on the summer reading game. Uh, moving along, team services, logs, and a flyer, adult uh, services, logs as well. Uh, if we move on to the next page two, uh, winter reading program, the printing of the logs for youth services, teen services, adult services. We have a uh, very successful bookmark contest that has been going on for many, many, many years. Uh, we did not have it this current year um, because of the pandemic, but uh, in, in place of it, we actually did something that we've never done before, and the newsletter that you all received um, in the mail uh, was actually, the cover was part of a newsletter cover art contest where we received submissions of, from all, all ages, and um, the winner, what is, who you see on the cover of the June July issue. So instead of having a bookmark contest, we did a newsletter cover art contest instead, which um, you know did not have any financial value in regards of printing the specific cover or anything like that, but we would like to go back to doing the bookmark contest, uh, which we get, I believe, hundreds of submissions for, for and that's, I think, K through 12, I believe. Lots of beautiful stuff, very hard to choose a winner. We have a lot of talented kids in our community. Uh, so the $500 here is to professionally print the bookmarks to a bookmark size. Um, there are some variables. Uh, sometimes there are 10 winners, sometimes 11, sometimes 12. So the $500 is to print 3,000 total bookmarks. Um, depending, and I mean, it depends on the, you know, whether we choose 10, 11, or 12 winners. Business cards, staff members have business cards, board members um, also have business cards for passing out at networking events or um, you know, to, to residents and patrons and card holders. Uh, we do send out a holiday card that goes specifically to our community partners, community officials, local libraries, and volunteers. And when I say local libraries, it is literally just the libraries in our surrounding area, not local libraries in regards to Chicagoland. Um, all right, so we have underneath holiday cards, promotional printing. Uh, there are certain promotional pieces that we do prefer to professionally print to exude the high quality that the Public Relations and Marketing Department puts together that when a resident, cardholder, taxpayer 
however you want to call them, when they see this brochure, they are proud of their library. The photos that we use, the graphics shine. Uh, you're just not going to get that same quality from a Xerox copy machine. Um, so there are brochures that um, we would like to print professionally. The, sec the, uh, the one underneath it is called the welcome packet, which um, we are working on right now that we would like to launch for uh, library card sign up month, which is when the kids go back to school. It is basically your one piece of marketing material that has everything the library has to offer in, a, in, in kind of a snapshot uh, view. Uh, this promotional printing for the art exhibit, I did bring an example. We have on our third floor, it's called the Franklin Gallery. If you go up the stairs, make a right. Um, we are actually very, very happy that we finally have an art exhibit in there. It's been empty, it's been a sad, sad white walls. Um, but uh, now we have an exhibit, and it's actually a beautiful exhibit. If there's no time today, maybe come a little earlier tomorrow and check it out. Um, it is called Forentivity. And it's actually digital art that was done by our local teams. Now, we actually were very, very pleasantly surprised at how many teams participated. Do you have an amount? I think it's like it's more than 30. I'm not sure the uh, uh, amount is up there, but there's over uh, 30 people up there. Yeah. So what we would like to do when we have art exhibits like this is to outsource the printing. Uh, remember, these are digital, this is digital art. Um, I just want to read an example. This is not teen art. <laughs> this is actually one of the book, uh, newsletter cover art submissions, but just to show you, eight and a half by 11 goes into this frame. There are these rods that the art exhibits sit on. They look very beautiful up there. Um, so we like to, especially 30 to print and to trim, um, does take time, everything really takes time, right? So uh, if we could ship those out uh, when um, we do those kind of art exhibits, we would like to have that ability in the next fiscal year. Stationery here, also similar to merchandise, because it has the library information on it, it comes through my department. Uh, letterhead envelopes that are used for um, you know, professional letters, envelopes for patrons for overdue fines or any other type of letters that need to be sent out. And um, I believe each of you that did your tour and you came to the Public Relations and Marketing Department, we have a giant printer, a poster printer. Um, so every banner that you see, every poster, um, Get, gets printed on there, so we do need the paper rolls in order to, to do that. We also need the ink in order to, to, to print on the paper, and then also uh, kind of a miscellaneous printing supplies is foam board. Uh, the signs that we put on easels need to be put on foam board, foam core, however you want to call it, to make sure that they stand up nicely. So just to kind of have that uh, would be very, very helpful. Postage and freight is number eight. Um, so, postage and freight, the first one here is the newsletter. It's about $2,200 per newsletter uh, to do for the postage. And what that includes um, is we do two different kinds of mailings. One mailing is called a carrier route mailing, which, uh, it, which I should say, let me say it this way. One of the mailings is called carrier route. The other one is uh, a is a list of addresses that we call a supplemental list that get mailed in a different way. Uh, the carrier route, uh, I, it's a little cumbersome, so I'm trying to figure out the best way to explain it. It's not confusing. Let me start with the supplemental list. So carrier routes are great because you have one zip code and there are multiple carrier routes per that zip code. Uh, Visographic is our printer that we use. It does have a mailing department, and they, based off of what the carrier routes, how many homes are in that carrier route, they organize uh, how many need to go, and they label based on the carrier route. So it's easier for the mail person to uh, grab the carrier routes that are in their section, if I to explain it that way, um, so that they could distribute them to each home. But the supplemental list, in order to save costs, because we feed into Displains and Glenview, we don't want to do the carrier route because then we would be sending it to people that aren't part of our district. Um, they, they most likely go to Glenview Library or Displains Library. So that supplemental list is a list of specific addresses 
that are our taxpayers to make sure that they receive the newsletter in the mail. I do have to say, uh, I believe it was a few years ago, that supplemental list was much longer. Anybody that wanted to be on it, we sent it to them. We have scaled back. Uh, there are about over 2,000 addresses in there, and I went line by line to make sure that they are in our district, and also um, made sure that patrons that weren't taxpayers were not receiving this. Businesses do not receive, I don't think that they receive the newsletter. So, uh, you know, who receives the newsletter? This postage cost is literally the homes of our residents. Uh, miscellaneous postage, um, we would like to uh, potentially in the next fiscal year, now that things are kind of normalizing, to do a direct mail piece to in, to target areas of our community that um, do not have library cards, they, uh, or they, they have not signed up for a library card. We want to encourage. Um, you know, there's been a lot of um, comments on um, the uh, percentage of library card uh, holders and such, and we. Uh, would love to see that number go higher. Um, definitely with our Best Deal Ever campaign, it went higher during that time. I think we saw an increase of almost 13%. So, I mean, I I am go team go. I, want, I would love to go higher. I would love to do more. Um, so, but without the funding, we unfortunately will not be able to do more. I believe that's everything. Are visographic did still come in as the chip? Yes, I get calls all the time from from printers, and visographic has been the best uh, price, uh, definitely the best customer service I've ever experienced. Uh, in regards to some research, uh, it's on page two hundred. I'm sorry, three hundred and twenty-nine. There is a screenshot and some information from the survey that was conducted a few months ago to get the patron feedback of their comfort level with COVID and what they are expecting of the, of the library in the future. And one of the questions was, uh, which are the best ways for you to get information about the library services and programs? And 40, almost 48% said both print and email. So it goes back to my argument on you can't just do one thing, two things. You have to do multiple marketing channels in order to get to as many people as possible. Um, you know, if we did go to four times a year, I, I would definitely not suggest eight pages. We are currently right now with our eight pages, putting only a fraction of our programs. We ask each department to give us what we call the top five, and they probably do five times that those programs. So we really are excluding a lot of what we have to offer with the eight pages. If we were to go four times, I would go back to the four four times a year when we did sixteen pages. It, 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 what I observed is on the two inches on the left side, there was 
artwork and not program system. Then we had like two columns of programs toward the center, the same on the other page. So one third of that space was just, well, I mean, just decorations and on top and bottom of the border. You had quite a bit of space that was not listing programs. Sure, I mean, with all due respect, I think it is important that the newsletter looks a certain way. I can tell you whether it matters or not that this library does one of the best library marketing that you can see in Philadelphia. Our, our award with the John Cotton Dana Award, which is the most prestigious library communication award, I'm not sure if it's worldwide, it's definitely throughout the United States. So we definitely pride ourselves on the quality that we, that we put for this library. Um, and you know, none of us are millionaires working here by any means, but it's because we love working here. There's probably in the 16 years that I've devoted here, I'd probably say my first uh, uh, most committed thing is T-Mobile, the second is the library, and the third is my wife. So that's how much I love this library that I've been here for 16 years. I am young, I could have gone to many other places. I love this community, I love this staff, the staff is family, and what we do here, I don't remember the last time I had a boring day to say, oh my God, like it's at five o'clock. Usually it's six o'clock and my wife is texting me, where are you? So we, we, we really, really, really love what we do here. And you know, with the newsletter, whether we do it or not, whether the board decides to go in a different direction, I mean, the marketing department has more than enough to do to, to keep us busy, uh, but I think offering more pages, offering it to every taxpayer in this district. You are being inclusive of all of them. I feel like if we're gonna go and pick and choose, we are not being inclusive of every single taxpayer that, you know, what they pay in taxes keeps this library alive. Um, that's my opinion. And that's not even because I'm the supervisor or anything like that, that's just as, as just kind of. Probably the fact of the matter is, about 80% of the people that get the newsletter do not come to the library. Even if they get the newsletter, they're not going to come. It's so, not only about coming to the library, though. It's them being informed of what their tax dollars are going for. For example, uh, they might never come to a children's program, but they might be really happy to know that we offer all of these things to the children in our community, and they think their tax dollars are well spent. I, I think we could get by with quarterly publication and fill in monthly online supplement. That's my opinion. Thank you. I happen to be a marketing major, so I understand. We should talk sometime. <laughs> I'd love to learn. 1960s. So. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Justin. I know that you are very involved in St. John Rebuff. I would love for you to be that connection to this library. Um, I am not opposed to anything that you said. Because it's a, it's a key of opportunity for everyone. Absolutely. And it gives you actual input from other students and other family members as well. And I think if you piggyback with them, that's the most important. That's great. Well, and uh, he has done that a little bit with Jim and I, Junior High, has done some of the uh, music programs, the Winter Palooza, they've done some of the entertainment at Winter Palooza in the past, so yeah, we love to do that. I think it's a great idea, we love that connection to St. John. And then also, I think if you um, actually go to your high schools and do like a shadow day for them to actually experience the marketing program as well, that will give them an actual opportunity to be a part of the community and actually work with one another. Absolutely, that would be phenomenal. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Trustee Kalushik, a question. First off, thank you for being so thorough. Uh, <laughs> thank you for listening. Uh, I guess just on this graph, this one, mm -hmm. 
I was wondering, uh, for the other, there were some responses. Does it say what those responses were, or like what the alternatives could be, as opposed to print or email? Would that mostly be like social media? Yeah, I, I, I don't have that in front of me, but from oh. what I remember, Susan. It, it was, they could actually put it on Facebook. Social media, okay. Yeah. okay. Most people want everything, is what it comes down yeah. to, and they had some additional ideas for more places we can do. Okay. So that's all for me, thank you. Thank you. And Trustee Rosansky. Uh, thank you, Sasha. I think that, and I know, everything you do is above board and the awards you've received in your department. I am truly grateful we have you in your department here. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Rosansky. Thank you, Trustee Olson. Yes, um, I think uh, Ms. Schoenfeld's suggestions are excellent. But um, remember, those cost money as well. Um, looking at Sasha's printout, I noticed red words at the bottom. Library card sign up reduced. Winter clues are reduced. Reopening celebration eliminated. And staffing, total hours in this department will be reduced, will be, or should be reduced, it says. In professional development, all professional development will be eliminated. All dues for public relations and marketing, eliminated. I, I can't understand how you expect to, how one expects to promote the library the way it has been promoted um, with that reduction in, in cost. So, Sasha, I want to thank you for serving our community in such an excellent way. And it, uh, hopefully you will be able to continue yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Olson. Thank you, Trustee Olson. Uh, Trustee Keen Adams, any questions? Yes. Um, I'm wondering, I, I noticed a note here that it, about the um, newsletter should be available online. Isn't it already available online? It is already available it is. online. Okay. Um, Sue, I really like those ideas also, by the way. Those are good ideas. Yeah, I do have a question about the 18-hour position. It looks like, just on the page, because it looked like that was being made in the box that I saw. Um, or if anyone knows the answer to that, you can just let me know. Um, I'm sorry, um, so looking at, I didn't She's hear. looking for the, I think she did not hear me. No, I, I didn't hear the question. Oh, I was she looking for the page that reflected the second uh, long uh, horizontal one. Um, oh, okay. About cutting staff. Yeah, I think the first page says programming, there's no number two, and then number three is staffing. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. this for uh, uh, horizontal. Number three. All right. There's so many people going on. It's kind of crazy. I'll just. Oh, that's the other one. All right, but it basically it looks like there's a suggestion to cut the 18 hour position. Is that correct? Yes. For once, thank you. So, um, yes. that how would that affect your department, Sasha, if we didn't have that? Um, I think that it would greatly affect my department. As I mentioned earlier, um, the staff member in that role has done over 120 of. Uh, you know, ed editing and doing the post-production of these virtual programs so that they are available, as we call, on demand. Um, we're actually getting bigger value, I think, by having a staff member to do that because not only did the people that attended that program see it live, but if you missed it, you want to see it again, it's a historical one, and you missed a detail that you want to learn, having that uh, ability to go on your website, as I mentioned, it's called the on-demand webpage, to get the list of the programs. Um, I mean, we would 
would not be able to do that anymore, I don't think. Is she also responsible for posting the um, meeting videos the next day? She is. Okay, is that even a possibility for her schedule? She's only here 18 hours. Is she here the day after the board meetings to be able to do that? Um, as I mentioned with like the special board meeting in particular, she does not here on Tuesdays, so I had to multitask between two different computers to get the job done. I think it's important to note that. Um, let me just see if I had anything else. Thank you. I think also it was a good point that if we were to go down to quarterly newsletters, they would definitely have to be longer than eight pages because you can't fit all that stuff in there. I feel like I miss stuff in the, in the newsletters and I, I'll see things on Facebook actually saying, oh, we had this program. I'm like, how did I not know about that program? I got the newsletter and I, I missed out and I, that makes me angry um, when that happens. But Trustee King Adams, if I could say, most likely that program, our multimedia assistant did the post-production on that program and posted it on our website. So that you were able to right. watch it in case you missed right. it. Um, and, and another point to make about the, the access online for people to be able to look at the, um, the newsletter online, a lot of senior citizens don't have access to that or don't know how to access that, so that would be eliminating that their knowledge of the programming. Also for kids, you know, depending on what their age is, I guess if they have access to look at that online. Um, but they really look forward to getting that in the mail and looking through the programs and, and marking it on the calendar and doing all that stuff with it. So I think it's a really big bonus for them to get that. Um, and yeah, it, it has to be readable. You know, it, it, if you try to jam too much information on there, it's gonna be difficult to read. Becky, can I ask one question sure, go ahead. while you're looking? Yeah, for stuff? thanks. Um, the, no, I'm trying to think. Ah, I know. The program that's going on tonight that I had to miss mm -hmm. with the author, is that going to be on there? It should be. Now, I do have to say, with having a very known author, there may be different rights and stuff. But I, I do have to say, um, it escapes me, the, a few authors that we've had recently, where we did have the rights to have the... Like Coburn? Exactly. Yeah. Did he, you get yeah. the rights for him? Yes, we did. Okay. I think that might even still be on our YouTube channel. So oh, I'll on tell you, that page. was a fantastic program. That's why I was disappointed I couldn't see tonight. So, so I would say most likely, but I'm not. I didn't negotiate the contract, so I'm not sure. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I have some information on that. Um, the uh, publisher objected to recording an interview, uh, as I understand it, so it won't be on. Okay, uh, so I missed it. So be it. Thank you. If we could get back to this discussion, I Thank did you. have a couple of she questions. I was. I hate to say one more comment. You're not finished. Okay, please continue. Yes, it's just one more comment. I just wanted to mention that the Facebook or the social media outlets, even though they can't be measured um, and maybe a reliable way, it doesn't mean that they aren't effective. Um, I think we've all seen. The results of what can happen on everything Niles Facebook page, so we know it gets out there. People see it, and especially parents, I think, are able to see that um, very easily and use that that social media a lot. So I think it's a good way to go. Thank you. Okay, I'm sorry. In terms of your library card sign-up event, do yes. you know how many of breakdowns in terms of how many students, adults, and so forth attend these events? Um, I, I wouldn't have the information for the last time we did it, um, but if we did it, if we do it again, I'm sure we can include a process of getting that information. Because we would like to see a breakdown as to who attends and how many people attend. Thank you. Thank you. Do, do you uh, measure later on, let's say you uh, issued 200 cards, do you go back, let's say, and six months later, look at how many people have actually used those cards? I don't in particular. I'm not sure if there's another staff member. Um, because sometimes people get a card they call mail, but they don't come to the library. I, I have a question. What is the legalities on this? They actually looking at personal information about the cards. Is there a, a staff, legal? Staff can do that. Staff can do it, but as far as giving that information to us, 
really? Is that legal? Because I know there are some legality issues. Yeah, there. we, there's, uh, we can only give you broad numbers, but right. I, I don't it even would know be if fine. I don't know if that is something that's available. That's a more of a city question since she's the one that manages all our CCS. Thank you. Also, is there a possibility maybe to communicate more often with regular library patrons? Because you and I know that probably 80% of people in this district do not use the library. And if we can get those 20% more informed that are attending the programs regularly, um, I don't know, maybe a supplemental mailer or something, or just, you know, quarterly to everybody. And, you know, so we, I mean, we try something new, new ideas, maybe more effective, maybe less costly. Instead of How do we know that 80% don't, don't uh, use it? How, do we know exactly how many uh, library cards were used, let's say, in the year 2019 when we didn't have COVID? How many different cards, how many different persons use the library by the number of cards? Do we, we don't care, we, do we have those statistics? Yes, we can get that number. I don't have it here, but we have the number of unique cards used in a year. And if we wanted to do an additional mailer, then that would cost more money too. You'd have to budget for that. Possibly. I've had residents tell me they come into the library to get information. They don't necessarily use their card when they come in here, each time they come in here. I so by knowing yeah. how many card holders have been in here, you actually have to use the card to judge. I, I don't think we know how many residents. We have 58,000 residents. I'm sure we don't have more than 20,000 that are, and probably a lot less that are regular library users. That are regular users, and then there's users that may become once a year or something like that, or once every two years also, but, you know. But that is part of the role of the trustee. That is part, that's going to be part of your job now, is to get those library card numbers up, get people in here, come up with ideas that will draw upon the yeah. public. Fandom Fest was actually a very popular event, but we didn't even try budgeting for that this year because we know how opposed you are to it. No, I thought last time you had Fandom Fest, it was pretty unsuccessful in that no, part. No, 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 no. The last one, I was here. So, here, so was I. The last Fandom Fest, and the attendance was here. not relative to the first one. It was not the same, but it was still very successful. But that was the comment that was made to me by staff, so I wouldn't make it up. But if we're finished, I have a few questions. Are all the trustees finished asking questions? Because I'd like to jump in before we get off the topic again. Um, regarding the comments of eliminating a position in marketing or PR, um, that was not recommended by me or Joe. The recommendation was that our current hours are 54, and for some reason all the documentation said 70. And since we're still in the middle of this COVID, uh, post-COVID situation, we're saying that the hours should reflect 54 until we get out of this situation. But as far as reducing hours, that's not telling one person you're out of a job. They should be proportionally decreased. And it would be absorbed by everyone on a smaller scale in the department. But where you decided that this employee is being told to leave is beyond me. So um, I don't appreciate that. Because again, here we go, starting all this fear and making false accusations, which is not true. Can I speak to that? And so many people have commented about that, not at this time. Okay, in addition, what I'd like to say for um, public, for the information you gave Sasha, very thorough, I do have a question because I'm interested in the social media ads. Um, I know um, I know we have them, I've seen them on, on Facebook, and, and you did mention there are four places where you do you list them on social media. I was wondering, could you give us a list of the social media ads that maybe took place in the past year? Because yeah. I've only come across them like accidentally. Sure. So I don't really know for sure where or what it is. Mm -hmm. And then I had a question when you were going through your programs, I must have been looking at looking at two different sheets. Oh, here we go. Um, 
it says your individual in-person program recap, and then you had um, program expenses number one, which is what you were reading from. This is what you were reading from? Correct. But for some reason, the cost of the programs on this sheet are not equal to the recap. For example, um, Super Sunday is five, Super Sunday here is 1,000. Here it's 1547.68. Um, summer reading kickoff is 1500 on this number one programs page, but on this recap, it's 2590.55. So are there other costs that are incurred? I mean, which one's the total? That includes cost? the personnel costs that you asked um, everybody to go okay. through and identify in their exercise. So the actual total cost of the program is here. Yeah. Because we do need staff in order for these programs to exist. So then I just want to make a point of, of, of mentioning that the cost of these programs on number one programs page, the um, legal side document, is really not accurate. It's the one off of here, which is the total cost, which I think is, is more relevant to, to us performing our budget. But I just, I didn't know why there was a difference. But we should always go with the total cost because we do need the staff in order for these programs to exist. Um, and I think that was the only question I had. I can't, I did have one more, but it escapes me right now. Um, but Trustee Keen Adams, did you have another question you wanted to ask? No, I just wanted to respond to what you said. Oh, by all means. Um, so I just, you know, I think you mentioned an accusation of eliminating program opposition. And, and there were fear about things happening. And so I just want to give it a little perspective, I guess. Um, you know, when we receive these documents with all the comments written on them, it, it's not explained at all. So all we're seeing is, you know, what has been prepared and then all these cross-outs and all these suggestions. So I didn't know who made the suggestions or how many people made the suggestions or exactly, like you just explained it a little bit better. But we didn't have that information before you just said that. So we're getting all this information, and, it, and that's what it looks like. It looks like things are being crossed out. And, and but we, Trustee Keene Adams has finish, never said that a finish, particular please. employee was losing her job. Okay, that is that's totally really rude. You didn't let totally me cut in on you, and you're cutting in on me. Let her finish. You used to always get upset when people interrupted you. I'm just well, trying I don't to, to get off topic. topic. Well, it's just on topic. topic. Let her finish. It, it, I'm trying to explain to you how it was perceived by us when we received it. I don't didn't have any explanation about what the thoughts were about eliminating, because one, one page says you're gonna go down to 54 hours. Okay, that's on one page, right? But then on another page it says that we're gonna be down 18 hours in this department. So I see that there's a position of one person who has 18 hours, so the logical connection is to think, well, that person's not gonna be here anymore because the explanation of reducing all the positions wasn't made to me until right now. Um, and so that's why everyone is thinking that it's going to happen. It's not because anyone said it. I'm not accusing anyone. In fact, I questioned it at length because I was looking for it, and I said, if anyone knows the answer, please let me know. I wasn't accusing anyone. Uh, I feel that I've come in tonight really pretty clear-headed and level-headed, and I'm asking questions, and I'm trying to be respectful, and I think when things are put together in such a way that we have to meet together on such a short notice three nights in a row we don't have time to discuss with each other what is actually going on in the heads you know like i would really like to know what is the end picture that you have or you and joe have because i'm not sure who's been in on this like who's making these notes i don't even know but yeah, like what's um what is like what does your library look like two years from now i would like to you know i think we should all get together and discuss these things before making well, and that's why we're having budget workshops and budget meetings. But back to my point, it was never discussed in the meeting that Joe and I had with Greg Pritz that any specific positions were going to be eliminated. It was a matter of, according to the budget, you're going to 70 hours, but we're currently functioning at 54, and we're still post-COVID. Okay, nobody's losing their jobs, but if there's going to be cuts, then everybody loses a few hours if we're not going to be open, but you don't eliminate positions. And, and maybe what I, I'm, I'm a little unclear about the, the lack of clarity that you're bringing to my attention about the documents received. If something was lined out, obviously, I believe it was Joe who did most of the lining out. 
Okay. And it was eliminated, but everything, there was no assumptions that should have been drawn by anything. If you were unclear, ask a question. But to put That's in document, doing. but to document on these pages that were distributed that this position's being eliminated and some other comments that were made that aren't factual, again, we're constantly making false accusations. Initially, when Susan opened the meeting, you weren't here. You weren't here. Right. But her description of what was on these documents, she only gave you half of it. I she had didn't to disagree you, with that. I was she listening didn't you, to that. And she didn't just... give the alternatives that were mentioned. So again, we're inciting all this fear. It's not the purpose Which of this meeting. Which is one thing you're very used to doing yourself, isn't it, Carolyn? With your stuff you put, put in the newspaper and everything? Stop. Yeah. I'm just calling it the way it is, buddy. You can do it, but nobody else can do it. Are there any further questions? Can we quit now? Are we done? I think we're finished with that. Okay. Um, Thank you, Justice. Thank you, Sasha, for enduring this meeting. Um, all right, and Susan, I guess there were a few requests for additional information. Could you somehow coordinate that with the different departments? Like I asked for the um, the social media um, ads for the past year. I, I don't know who. Yeah, I think Sasha wrote that. Okay, and I don't know, were there any other requests? Sue had requests, so I will, I guess I think we decided at one time that if one board member receives the documents, then we should all receive the same documents. Absolutely, but I'm just trying to coordinate the fact that the information yeah. will be obtained. The purpose to do with passports, and Athena is looking into that, and those are the only two that I am aware of. But Sue, did you have a couple things for Sasha? Um, yes, in terms of how many people actually attended the actual meeting, why is there a problem? Yeah, but he doesn't have that. He said until the next one, he can't give you that information. And then what was the other thing? And that was the actual information. Oh, that was just email. Okay. All right, and Susan, I guess what I'm thinking is um, could you, is that information that can be scanned and emailed to us? I mean, I don't know what's the. That's the way we can understand, I don't know, but we will follow We have three more days, or two more days of this. So I'm thinking at the end of it, if we can get the information sent to the trustees, either dropped off on Friday and emailed, that would be perfect. Then we can all review it and prepare for whatever. Yeah. Well, is everybody all right with just emailing? Because the dropping off is costing the library quite a bit of money. And as long as it's, it's, it, it's through our Niles Library and you're sending us, we know, okay, this is. From Susan, we should definitely. This is my priority here. I prefer. I prefer both. I mean, because right. I, I can't print all these documents. Okay. Well, I mean, I think well, it's also going to be like single figures on some of these things. It's not a lot. But either way, I would prefer paper documents. Right. Right. drop it off and email so that we always have a maybe, permanent record. Maybe you can go pick it up. If I could, I would, but unfortunately, I can't. Right now. All right, um, since there aren't any further questions, I would like to th thank the staff for participating in our first budget workshop. Uh, we appreciate your time and your input, and um, if I could have a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Yes. Second. I'll second. 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 Okay, we are now adjourned. Who seconded? I did. Yes. 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 Yes.